Call the meeting to roll at the record show that this is a regular city council meeting held on Monday, December 19th. All members of council are present. The press has been duly notified. Would everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and Council is going to remain standing for a moment of silence. You are welcome to join us if you'd like. Thank you very much. Item number one on the agenda, special presentations, is the SCLEA accreditation for the TEK Police Department. And we're going to have our chief come up and uh, explain that to us. For the record, that is Chief Parker. Yes. Uh, Chip Johnson, if you would come on over here. And uh, what, what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, just wanted to, is that all? Okay. Uh, I wanted to thank Mayor, Council, City Management, and uh, citizens of TGK. Uh, it's with great joy, pride, and pleasure uh, that uh, we have found that we have been awarded accreditation. Uh, I can say that the only way this has happened is with the great staff. Uh, they made it all happen. It's typically a three-year process, uh, and we accomplished rewriting this entire manual uh, within two years. Uh, I give all the credit to the accreditation team. I'd like for them to stand up. Uh, if they would. They were all for the For the past 20 months, they've uh, rewritten this entire manual. Um, I must point out the true catalyst that made it happen is uh, Lieutenant Spence and Major Nelson. I have to give them a, a big, big amount of credit. Uh, Lieutenant Spence worked, uh, in fact, I sent him, sent him home on an ambulance one day, so uh, I almost gave him a heart attack. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he worked countless hours, weekends, nights, and holidays, uh, and, yeah. and he was truly, truly appreciated for what he did, his effort, uh, because what he has done is, is make it better for the citizens of TGK, um, the police department. Uh, our policies are a living document. This is, you know, some people write these policies and they basically put them on a shelf and, and they're just something that's up there and it's written. These, these are something that we live it. Uh, so we had to make sure that we proved to the accreditation board that we actually did what we say we did. Uh, they came in uh, and reviewed our paperwork and our policies and our manual uh, and it was over a couple month process of doing that. Um, so what does this do? Uh, this makes sure that the TGK Police Department is operating at the most professional level of law enforcement practices around the country and state, uh, which is very important right now, especially in law enforcement. We want to make sure that we're doing the best practices, which help reduce risk and liability to the city, which is very important uh, to make sure that we're operating that way. So as I, as I move forward and, and call Mr. Johnson up, I just wanted to thank council, mayor, and management, but mostly thank the staff because I'm truly appreciative because without them, this would not have occurred. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Mayor and councilman, it is an honor to come before you tonight on behalf of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Accreditation Council. The work that has been done by the folks that the chief acknowledged just a few moments ago goes far beyond your imagination, I can assure you. <laughs> this is a tremendous amount of work. They have met or exceeded 297 different standards required for an agency. Not only have they met those, but they have put all the work behind it, and as this has built a foundation for them now to grow upon and to work upon. Uh, the, the accreditation manager often doesn't like to hear from us when they come in the first time because we explain to them in great detail <laughs> that your first time is going to be your easiest time. Oh, boy. Because now they have set the goal and the standard by which they agree to operate and do their work. In three years from now, when they come back for accreditation, 
they will be held to determine if, in fact, they have now done what they said they were going to do. And they have to have justification and all the documentation to show that they have met each and every one of these standards every year, every time under certain circumstances. So this is a tremendous undertaking that the chief of your department has taken over. As you know, this is not a requirement. They volunteered for this. They now have joined the ranks of a very small percentage of law enforcement agencies in this state who are accredited. But I will assure you, your department will run tremendously better as a result of it. The professionalism of this agency is second to none. Having read that report and having had an opportunity to speak with these folks at the time that they were awarded this accreditation a month or so ago, I was truly impressed, truly impressed with the quality of the professionalism of your agency, the men and women that comprise that agency, and the work that they're doing. There were some areas that we had some concern about. And I think initially for their first accreditation, they did extremely well going ahead to do a lot of work to meet some of these standards. Primarily, their biggest challenge is their facility. Mm. And that, that, while it is a challenge this time, the next time, I don't know that they're going to be able, without some changes made in that, to accomplish that. They truly have made this about as good as they're going to be able to make it work. But I think, and I was talking to the chief at the time, with the amount of growth that you've seen in your, your city in the next three years, what that will be, it's going to be obvious that they, they cannot meet these standards and remain there. It's going to be very difficult. So I thank you for your support for them. I will tell you that they will need to con your continued support going forward in three years from now to continue this. Uh, they're not sitting on their laurels with this. This is something that, he's, as he explained to you with these policies, they change. Situations change, technology changes, laws change. <clears throat> A lot of things impact the way they do their work. This all has to change with it. But your city administrator and the council and the mayor, without your support, they can't do this either. And they recognize that. And they're very fortunate to have it. So without further ado, it's, it's truly an honor to come tonight and to award this certificate to the TKK Police Department on their state accreditation in South Carolina. Cleveland fan, I don't think so, Dave. But, <laughs> but the Cubs rule, so it's all good. Well. Item number 1B on the agenda is the Catawba Park update, Camco Engineering, Mike Fry and Al Walters. If you guys would come to the podium. Charlie, if you can put the slides up. There you go. Um, I'm Mike Fry and Al Walters to my left here is our lead designer on this project. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come and give you a status report on where we are on the uh, project. Um, on the screen, that is the original master plan that we've been developing over the uh, course of the project that uh, continues to adjust as we get further into the, to the design and the details of the project, specifically phase one. Um, but just a quick reminder, the, uh, the red outlined area is the city's property, the orange area is the Springland property, and then the remaining property is the Duke Energy property. Um, just to help, the red prop, the red outlined is the baseball uh, complex. That's the city-owned property, the soccer complex. 
is the Clear Spring property. And then the open play fields and the bulk, if not all of the parking and uh, things of that nature and picnic shelters, that's the Duke property. And just to kind of give you a frame of reference. Right. Thank you, Charles. And so um, utilizing the master plan, we've been working on phase one. And Charlie, if you go to the next slide, which is uh, to utilize um, the city's property uh, by developing the baseball softball complex, which also includes the opportunity for uh, some youth soccer fields to be on the property. Um, and that piece of the project also includes a, a parking lot, of course, for the, for the facility to be used. Um, we're approximately 90% complete with the designs and construction plans on this, uh, and we'll be prepared to go uh, advertise the project for bid in the, in the very near future. Um, what I wanted to do tonight, just to give you an idea of where we've been, let Al tell you a little bit about some of the design challenges we've been faced with, and then we'll wrap up with um, a, just a generalized schedule of what, um, what we're going to be doing. So, yeah. Appreciate the opportunity to come and present this to you all. Uh, as we have explained uh, and, and gone through the plans before as we presented, uh, the initial phase of the project is going to be on the property that currently is owned by the, the city, and it happens to be the furthest site away from where the project wants to drain to, uh, which is the river or the, the main creek running down through the middle of the property. Uh, that creates some challenges to how we develop uh, this phase one po portion of the project. There is a, a, a high point and a ridge that falls between the city's property and the river, which creates a pocket where it is holding water. If you have had the opportunity to walk the property, you can, uh, once you get down past the dog park and, and start entering into the site, it's not long before you start uh, uh, hitting some mush as you walk on in there where you have areas that are, are ponding water. As a result of that, that creates an issue for us on how to drain the, the, the project and dewater that area. In turn, uh, the location for the main drive coming into the site as we've developed the concept and being able to wrap it around the arc of the outfield fences of the ball field. Uh, is coming in the general area where the current access is to the dog park. And if you're familiar with the dog park there, that drive drops in pretty quickly downhill into the, uh, the gravel parking area. To be able to get this, uh, the main drive, the entrance drive, into the park to be at a grade that is uh, easily uh, uh, traveled upon, uh, it is uh, requiring us to install or have uh, designed a retaining wall that will run between it and the one ball field outfield fence and that's just because of the drop in elevation that we're, we're needing to have accomplished. <clears throat> the, uh, the next uh, thing is uh, of, of challenge wise is due to the Duke Energy property and our inability to be able to access it at this point. Uh, and, as a result of that, the, the drainage issues that we have due to the topography uh, cannot be drained by a subsurface drainage system because we have no outlet low enough on the property to be able to accomplish draining the low points. As a result of that, we're having to raise the elevations of the ball fields to get them to an elevation where the exterior drainage system for it is able to sheet flow on off the property. And in turn, uh, that the one location for that sheet flow is onto the adjacent property, which would be to the right of the, the uh, city's property there. We don't intend on the permanent drainage direction to go that way, but because that's where the natural break is, 
uh, it will require us to put in a temporary detention basin in that location so that the increase in impervious surface area can be taken care of and we're not uh, discharging more runoff uh, in that direction than currently runs that way. And then finally, because of having to lift all of this site up, there's really no area of cut in grading uh, on that piece of property, which means that to be able to get the elevations of the ball fields to the elevation that they need to be to get the site to drain, we're looking at uh, it being totally in fill. Mm -hmm. And uh, that fill mm -hmm. condition in and around where the uh, infields are for the two uh, softball ba baseball fields would be somewhere in the range of a rise of six to seven foot in elevation from the current elevation that's out there. Uh, we're looking at probably an average of about three foot of fill over the development area of, of this phase of the park. And again, the whole, the whole reason why is we've <coughs> got to get it up to be able to sheet drain the project site uh, uh, in the directions of the Duke property and the adjacent property to be able to get that to work. Uh, if access was available, we would be able to run storm drain pipe on through and head towards the river and therefore we wouldn't need to be as high in, in elevation there. And lastly, because we can't enter onto the Duke property, where the we have intended for the main parking lot to be to serve this this phase of the project, uh, we're looking at developing a, a, a gravel parking lot that uh, will serve the park uh, as it opens, uh, which you'll you see in the in the corner of the site. So those are kind of the uh, summary of the limitations of, and that we and the challenges that we've been facing as we've gone on through the development of the uh, design plans for this phase of the park. Just to close up, if uh, unless there's any questions, we anticipate with, with council's approval, uh, we could advertise for bids in January, uh, which would allow us to have a groundbreaking start construction in March of next year. So that's that's where we are schedule-wise. We're ready to, to move into that level of work as, as soon as uh, the city's ready to, for us to do that. Thank you, Mike. Charlie, where are we with the uh, with Duke Energy uh, on the property? Um, Duke still has to get their uh, overall recreation uh, management plan approved by FERC, uh, which should be, uh, according to the latest email I, I received from them, uh, sometime this fall. Um, we are going through, uh, and Mr. McCleave and I will be ramping this up as we move through the Christmas holidays, but going through their, uh, their um, boilerplate lease agreement. Um, the last communication I had with them a few weeks ago is they were also going through it uh, because they felt like they needed to make some updates and changes, but they're not going to make them wholesale or really specific to just this park. So, um, and they can't sign any lease agreements until FERC blesses their overall um, recreation plan for all of their properties on the Catawba Watery. Oh, we can't even Do, get an easement does, or anything with they, they can't even give us an easement, no ma'am. Do they know about our limitations that yes, this sir. is causing us? Yes, sir. And there's no exception? FERC will use. not allow them to, to grant us any easement or access um, with any type of construction-related um, project, so to speak, on their property until we've entered into a lease. And they will not allow them to enter into a lease until they have blessed their plan for the whole thing. And when is that anticipated to occur? What's that? FERC blessing. Uh, by this fall. Fall, Fall of 17. 17. Oh, 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if we proceed as is currently planned, mm -hmm. um, what is the viability of the property, our property, with all of the fill and so forth? Is there going to come a time sooner or later where we're going to en end up having to do underground piping, do taking a remedial action to handle <clears throat> what we can't handle right now? It's, it's my understanding, I mean, um, as, as they pointed out, just below the, the red area, that temporary parking is a sediment pond yeah. uh, to handle that property. Uh, as that fills, yeah, we'll be taking underground uh, and putting it to its permanent spot. 
Um, I don't, unless Mike, these guys tell me otherwise, I don't see us having to regrade or lower our facility, uh, what, what they're doing now. I mean, I, it's my understanding the only undoing, so to speak, uh, would be the sediment pond and the gravel parking lot. Uh, giving way to the permanent uh, third ball field, as well as the the uh, continuation of the driveway onto the other properties. And is that why we're doing a gravel field? Is we, we know we're going to have to do something else at some point. Okay. Right. And time as well. What did you say, what Dave? I'm sorry. What is the anticipated cost yeah. difference for all this fill of an average of three foot for the whole area? And time. I think your construction cost for what you see on the screen there is around 1.5 to 1.7. And if we didn't have to do the fill, do we know what that anticipated would be? <coughs> Go to, I'm sorry, Mike. Could you, you come to the podium? To the Thank you. I, I would estimate it would be probably a 25% reduction. <coughs> mm -hmm. And how about for time? How, how much extra time is this taking? You know, with the dewatering that needs to be done on the site, either way, that's going to be the time factor to get it dried out. But probably you might be adding, you know, 30 to 60 days for importing all the fill material. Okay, and it, after yeah. it's dried out. Correct. But we're going to have to import some fill material either way. This okay. is just going to, re you know, if we could drain onto the Duke property now, <clears throat> then with pipes, then we could reduce the amount of fill material. Dave, what did you? I didn't hear your comment before. Or did Jen I was just, just talking about it? the the cost of putting in the fill. Okay. I think somebody said one million or so. Well, the, the uh, whole project, the total project, we estimate to be one and a half to one point seven million. And, and that's not just the cost of the fill. Twenty-five. Oh, twenty-five percent for the twenty-five percent right. less <laughs> approximately yeah, off yeah, of that an number. But that's significant. Yeah. One of the one of the biggest challenges I think we realized very early on is there was about one percent of fall from New Gray Rock Road yeah. to the Catawba River. It's, it's very very flat. Yeah. <laughs> and as as Mike pointed out, the fill material is going to have to be brought in regardless. Right. Um, well, yeah. It's just hard to move water across <laughs> flat ground. So right. um, we're going to we're going to have to do do some fill material, raise it up to move water where we need it to go, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Regardless, and I think that's going to be true across the entire 61 acres. So any access to the Springs years. property? Would that give us any benefit? You don't have any property contiguous. Right? We'd have to cut across the Duke Energy property. Uh, we did um, get the uh, the special use zoning variance from York County for the Springs property, um, so we should have a lease. We sent it to them. Our comments back to Springs about a month ago, Bob. So we're waiting on their comments back on that, but I, I would imagine here in the next, in another month or so, um, at worst case scenario, we should have a lease for council to consider with the, on the Springs property. Unfortunately, it's not contiguous to ours without going across the, the Duke Energy property. Charlie, if you can go back one slide, you can see no. that yep. where the property lines aren't, they don't come together. <laughs> There's a gap okay. between the red lines and Thanks the orange the line, with the soccer and the baseball. Mm -hmm. There's a gap in, in the property. Yep. And if I could add one, one other thing that may help, too. Because we have lifted this up, we have been able to reduce the amount of storm drainage pipe that we need in this phase because we're able to handle a lot of the runoff in, in swells that then dump out onto existing grade. Uh, so we're, we're not required to, to have a, an internal system that would be as if substantial as what we would need if the if the fields were down lower and we started draining in and through the Duke, Duke property. And, and the other thing is uh, that I wanted to add was that the intent is to develop a uh, flat bottom swell to help with water quality and the way we've designed the, uh, the in the master plan is to have the loop, along the, the loop drive going into the Duke property, you'll see a wide lawn area that's shown between it and the parking lots uh, around the soccer complex and all that. The plan is, is to continue a swell heading downhill towards the river uh, that uh, will 
will carry a lot of the runoff and therefore we'll be looking at just culverts under each of the driveways and uh, be able to minimize the parking lot uh, drainage systems as well. So uh, overall, even though you see a higher expense in grading here, I, I think in the long run it will help us in uh, the ultimate drainage system costs for the overall park. So, Charlie, uh, you're not asking us for any action, I guess. This no, ma'am, not at this time. It's just an, an update uh, as to you know, council uh, previously had authorized moving forward with 100% design on a phase one uh, and 30% design on the Duke Energy property, which they, they have been working towards. Um, and as they are nearing the end, wanted to just get them in front of you guys, give you all an opportunity to, to ask questions, let them... Yeah, let the experts be here on hand to answer those questions and just kind of let you know where we're at with things. Okay. I mean, and we'll, this will come back to council before there is any bidding for, for this next effort or? Um, yes, we, we can absolutely come back to council for permission to put out for bid or we can go out for bid. Uh, obviously, no notice of proceed would be given to anyone or bid awards given to anyone without council approval. But if council um, wants, wants to uh, have a look at everything uh, one last time before it goes out for bid, we most certainly can do that as well. I mean, that would be my preference. I don't know what my fellow council members. Char have Charlie, a, I'd also like, like to have a letter from the city sent to Rick Duran. He's the governmental liaison, correct? At yes, Duke sir. Energy. Mm -hmm. um, expressing to them that they're not allowing us to drain onto their land, and I get it, it's, for, it's a FERC issue, mm -hmm. is going to cost us about $450,000. Is there something they can do to speed up that process? I would like to be on record with Duke saying that, you know, hey, you're costing us money. Um, absolutely, can do that. Um, it might we we'll, we need to talk about maybe some, uh, potential DHEC issues with watershedding on a, on another property that we don't have control over yet, as well okay. as far as DHEC. So if we can do the DHEC, the Duke. Sure. Yes, sir. You know, Be glad and, to. And have that back to us in January before we make this ultimate decision. I think that would be we can beneficial absolutely. to all of us. Be glad to. Thank well, you. I think even possibly a comparison. I know you said it, it, it would save money on materials, and I know dirt's cheaper than pipe is. <laughs> yeah. But possible scenarios on if we wouldn't have to grade as high, here would be our cost on drainage material versus here's our cost on dirt. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. To give yeah. us a yeah. little better idea. That's and you said idea. the retention pond is also temporary because of this? Yes, it, it's because the natural or our planned ultimate drainage system is to take this water to the river. And with us being right on the river, we are able to apply to, uh, to DHEC for a detention waiver where we don't need to detain the water permanently on site. And uh, that, that's what our intent is. So the biggest thing that we need to treat is water quality. And that's why we're looking at developing the long flat bottom swells that uh, run off from the, the pavement areas will go into and before it enters into the river. Uh, but because the break point right now is onto the adjacent property to the, the east of the site, uh, where we ultimately will not be taking the runoff, uh, we're having to do a detention basin there temporarily so that the runoff that does go that way is no greater than what currently is headed in that direction. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Merry it. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Um, item number two on the agenda is public comments. Are there any public comments? No one has signed up for public comments, but are there any? There being none, move on to item number three, which is the approval of minutes. Um, council before you are the minutes of the regular city council meeting of November 21st and the special workshop on November 30th. Are there any questions or deletions to those minutes? Hearing none, those minutes stand approved. Item number four on the agenda is the um, unfinished business, um, which is 4A, which is the Coyote Management Program. <coughs> uh, City Manager Charlie Funderburg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, um, at our last meeting, Council directed me to, uh, uh, Mayor Shepard had spoken with the trapper and. Um, asked me to gain, uh, ask some questions to that person and, and have a conversation with them, um, get some more uh, info from them. Uh, I actually ended up speaking, uh, speaking with two local trappers, um, one's from Fort Mill and one's from Chester. 
Um, they trap coyotes they, uh, during this time of the year, and they relocate them to um, fox pens, uh, one actually over in Lancaster County. Uh, this is legal uh, with uh, SCDNR. Um, both of them, uh, to be honest, if I, if I did not know who I was talking to in both conversations, I'd have swore I was talking to the exact same person. <laughs> um, they, they know their stuff. Um, they go about it the exact same way. Uh, one would charge uh, $500, um, and that's basically just for him to come set his traps and everything else. He would check them daily. Uh, the other one didn't have an upfront charge, but charged anywhere between $50 to $75 per coyote caught. Um, so we could end up paying nothing or we could pay a lot or, you know, it just depends on, on what he caught. Both of them use leg traps. They use, um, they use bait, uh, to lure them in. Uh, they mark the traps with like surveying tape so that people know where the, the traps are. Um, they've both caught, uh, pets in the traps before, didn't hurt them, turned them loose, you know, like a dog, things like that. Um, these traps do not discriminate anybody or anything that steps in them would set them off, uh, but they don't completely close. They live, uh, leave a gap. So may break the skin, uh, but not break the leg, uh, is how it was described to me. Um, yeah, they would, uh, each check, uh, check the traps, uh, daily, which is also required by DNR, but it was good to hear them. Uh, say that I, they're very, very familiar with it, very experienced with it. I think either would do a good job. Biggest problem is neither one of them carry liability insurance at all. Mm. Um, Smurf will not allow us to hire a contractor. One of the biggest things they check every year is contractors that we've used. They carry workers' comp. If there are less than three people in the in the company, they're not required by the state to have workers' comp. But the other thing is, did they issue? Did they give us a certificate of liability insurance? Uh, do we have a copy of it? Is it list city, city of TK as additional insured? Every contractor that we use, we get that information from. Uh, both of these gentlemen do not carry liability insurance and have expressed to me they will not get it just to come do this. Um, doesn't mean they're the only two, but those are the two that I have spoken with. Um, there are companies out there that do this, um, but I have not talked to any that, that trap and relocate. Uh, they trap and will euthanize either on-site or off-site. Um, and there is a different fee for each, which I've explained to council in the past. So as part of that, um, I spent some time with, uh, with staff, uh, with, mainly with, uh, with Katie Paulson, as well as with Chief Parker. Um, we looked down at, um, at town of Mount Pleasant, uh, just outside of Charleston. Um, several years ago, they developed a coyote management plan uh, because they had a huge problem with coyotes to the point where they were having you know, 10 and 15 of them at one time by one of their water parks, sunbathing on the roads and in the parking lots. Uh -huh. um, it, <laughs> we haven't gotten to that level Maybe. to my knowledge. So um, they implemented a plan and uh, began um, uh, killing the coyotes. And then it became a PR nightmare for them because PETA and all the other uh, animal rights activist groups descended upon Mount Pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, they've been doing, um, according to the captain that Chief Parker spoke with, they've been doing this for about 15 to 20 years with this management plan. Over the last five or six, they re it really doesn't even come into play anymore uh, as far as getting lots of calls and things like that. Um, basically, the Cody's figured out where they were wanted and where they weren't wanted and have kind of moved out of these high high profile areas. Um, I included a, a management plan in the packet for you, but I did want to go over some of our own stats. Um, to date, or through November 7th, uh, from January 20th to November 7th, we received 51 calls that were documented through uh, 911. Now, this doesn't necessarily account for additional calls that I'm sure each of y'all got. I know we got some at City Hall, but we had 51 that were called in uh, through 911. Uh, 61% 61, 61 of those calls came between January 20th and March 24th. It tapered off a lot uh, as we moved into the summer months. Um, the vast majority of those calls were um, they either heard one or they think they saw one. Um, we did have uh, two that uh, said that there were encounters uh, or attacks on their pets. Uh, most of them were either heard one or saw one, you know, on the golf course or, you know, near my backyard kind of thing. Um, majority of the calls came from residents living near holes five through eight of the pines and holes 15 through 16, the Grandview. Um, just to show you a map, um, 
and this is a map that, uh, in speaking with Chief Parker, we can update on a uh, on a quarterly or semi-annual basis, um, just so folks know. But the two circled areas, um, that's yeah, the the one to the the left, uh, the north the west side there. That's um, the area of the pines that I was referring to previously. Um, and then the one to the uh, to the southeast side is the area on the Grandview side of the golf course. Um, more on the northeast side or northwest side. Um, that was that was the primary uh, source of the calls. Um, the other little dots are just you know uh, one hitter type things. I, I heard one or I think I may have seen one, hmm. and they called nine one one. Um, and oh, you can see it's there's a couple out in Lake Ridge. There's yeah, most of them are near bodies of water, but uh, not necessarily um, in in every case. So that's just kind of the mapping side of things. Well, um, so yeah, I, we put together this management plan. Um, we based it off of uh, Mount Pleasant's plan actually, uh, because they had been so successful with it. And the biggest thing that I got from it um, is. And we also got from from talking with them is stressing public education um, more than anything. Um, there are a ton of rumors and myths out there that we have found uh, about coyotes um, that aren't necessarily true. Um, getting those those facts, making sure that they're readily accessible on our website, yeah, you know, on a flyer, uh, you know, brochure, something like that, um, to keep folks educated. Um, yeah, uh, we heard it at the forum. Um, there was a, uh, the, uh, chief over the, the fur bearers, uh, side of things for DNR was actually quoted in the paper, um, just the other day or over this weekend. Yeah. Biggest thing is, you know, not feeding them. Yeah. I mean, don't make the food sources easy. You know, people with deer feeders and people feeding their dogs and pets outside and leaving the food bowls outside and things like that. Um, yeah, not, not making it an attractive buffet or an easy buffet. I think he, he said in the paper, you know, it's easier to walk up and meet it out of a dog, dog bowl than it is to run around the woods trying to catch it. Sure. Um, the, uh, uh, Mount Pleasant had a big success, um, where they were, they were training and teaching folks, you know, about hazing the animals, you know, don't make them comfortable, loud noises, spotlights, you know, to, to make them not feel comfortable. The problem is, is, you know, one house is not making them feel comfortable and the next house has deer feeders and, you know, bird feeders Solids. and things like that. And they're inviting all the critters from the animal, uh, from, the, from the forest out. Um, yeah, so the biggest message that I personally have heard loud and clear from uh, the multiple conversations with SEDNR, doesn't matter what we do, um, we can't throw enough money at it. Uh, it's not going to go away just by trapping and killing or relocating. Um, it, it, this is going to be a constant forever type thing if this is what council wants to take on. Um, obviously from staff perspective, we'll, we'll take our direction from y'all in whichever direction council wants to go, we'll absolutely tackle. Um, yeah, but I guess uh, the staff recommendation at this point would be to, we haven't had any um, human attacks um, there have been a few, in, um, by the definitions that we've placed in the Coyote Management Plan, and these, these fall along with um, DNR terms, uh, so it's not just something that, that we've invented. Um, there, there have been a couple of attacks that, that we know of for certain, uh, two, uh, that were for, for certain Coyote attacks, others that maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Um, there seemed to be a handful of encounters uh, where yeah, it was a Coyote human encounter, um, but a lot of it is that they're hearing them, um, they're reporting stuff, they're reading on Facebook and things of that nature. Um, uh, a staff's recommendation would be to continue to push that public education. Um, yeah, um, but again, we, we, we serve it at your pleasure. So whichever direction council wants to go with this, we are uh, absolutely on board with. Um, and with, Ma with that, Mayor, I will turn it back over to you and council. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Dottie, I'll start with you. Any comments? I mean, this is just one of those situations that it's hard to know what the right thing is to do. I mean, well, first of all, with the trappers you talk to, there's nothing to do because without liability insurance, it's a non-starter. So uh, if we wanted to move forward at all, we have to find somebody else that has liability insurance and we're talking about a price or a cost that's gonna be much higher. Um, I still have the same fear. My fear is other, other things, people, 
animals getting caught in traps and they're only catching checking traps once a day and so you could have an animal in there for you know close to 24 hours and i which just becomes feed for the coyote it's just a bad scene and you know i'm a feeder of deer and birds but i haven't fed anybody in quite a little while because the coyotes have the fajibi scared out of me they're still coming they're coming to my backyard so that not feeding isn't helping either because they're out there every night um, but in any event, I, I certainly support, you know, the management plan. It doesn't say anything. I, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I mean, it just sort of documents what we've been talking about and, you know, suggests that we know that there is at least an issue and that we need to pay attention to it, which I think we're doing. So I think this sort of documents what we've been doing. I think we should stay that course for a little while longer. And, you know, if we start seeing uh, coyote sunbathing at the, at the pool or, you know, at the lake, then I think maybe we have to talk about, you know, what do we do next? I mean, if somebody could come in and just pick them up and take them away, that would be great for me, but that, it's just not that, that easy. And the thing that annoys me the most is that South Carolina actually captured all these male coyotes and tagged them and then released them and put out a program that says if you're a a uh, hunter and you kill one and you bring it back to us and it has a tag on it, we're gonna give you a free hunting license or whatever. I free. say, if you caught the dog on things, why didn't you put them down then? So, you know, that's a whole different problem. Anyhow, I said enough, but I support the management plan at this point. I don't support going any further. Uh, I certainly am, don't object to you looking for other trappers, but I still have a hard time with the trapping thing because if a child gets stuck in it, uh, or uh, somebody's pet, and pets are more important than children and people to some folks. Um, I suspect that whether they have liability insurance or not, it's obviously going to come back on the city as well, and I think we do have to take that under advisement. Thank you. Ryan? Um, I guess my first quick question, because I'm, I'm all about giving it a shot. You never get on base if you don't take a swing. So uh, from the little bit of research I've done, which has been far from what you guys have, you know, there's some programs that are out there, assuming they do have liability insurance, where these traps are constantly under video surveillance. So you may not, you know, if you're only checking them, check them every 24 hours, there's still an opportunity for somebody to keep eyes on. Oh. Um, so I'd look in that direction because, uh, again, if we don't try, nothing's going to change. And we're not talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're talking about a smaller investment. Um, secondly, I guess my question would be, so myself, I live on a greenway. If these trappers you talk to have a business license with the city and I want to call Trapper B and say, hey, dude, I'm okay with giving you 10 bucks a coyote if you come on out or 50 bucks a coyote if you come on out, is that something that's feasible for our citizens to say, hey, it scares me? Somebody, If they're in your backyard every night, does Council Member Hersey have the option Assuming this trapper has a business license with the city, hmm. does she have the option to hire him to put a trap in her backyard and she could keep an eye on her pets and her children and everything else where it's in a more of a controlled environment? But it's not a, you're not taking anything there's away from the citizens. You're giving them the option yeah, there's so they can. Hmm. There's, to there's do their own they, thing that's in a they, more, more humane fashion. They cannot shoot and kill the animal no no no. but, but trapping the there there is nothing in our code um that that prevents them from being able to do so on their property on their property uh, they could not do it on city-owned property and they could not discharge a they could not euthanize the animal with with you know obviously with a firearm or something like that uh because that is uh spoken to in the code but there's there's nothing in the code that's pre would prevent someone from putting a trap on their own property Okay. Um, they would assume the liability and, and everything else on it. It's not something that I'm, I would encourage. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if they're doing it on their property, currently right now in the city code, there's nothing that uh, prevents them from being able to do so. Because right, I just, everybody I've spoken with, it's a 50-50. You know, yeah. some are like, hey, let them be. We can't stop it. There's nothing we could do. The more we mess with them, the more are going to come, the more they're going to reproduce. Others are like, you know, like myself, if we don't try, nothing's ever going to change. And so, you know, it could go either way. Yeah. But I'm definitely open to suggestion on, you know, either continuing to look or just sticking with the management plan, which I think is a, a step in the right direction because it shows we're absolutely trying to address the issue. 
but I'm still open to suggestion. I, I guess, didn't think about the video surveillance point. I think that's a, a point worth pondering. Mm -hmm. Charlie, do you know if that's still subject to that three-month window of December through the end of February? It's, it's my understanding that it's December 1 to March 1, yes, sir. Even for the, for the trap and relocate. Even if it's on your own property? Uh, yes, sir. I think, I think the, whole, the whole time span has to do with the, the relocation part. Uh, more so than just the trapping part. Um, I think you can trap and, and kill any time of the year. Uh, it's just the trap and relocate, from what I understand from DNR, is the December 1 to March 1. Hmm. Jen? Well, I uh, would have to agree that we need to have a different way to be able to evaluate if there's something in the trap. So mm -hmm. I, I think with technology today, I mean, you could definitely have some sort of live camera up that would be a smart way for us to avoid um, trapping something long term that's not supposed to be in there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, because the management plan does say if we were to, or the staff or police were to determine there was a dangerous coyote, we would have to implement some way of getting rid of them. So we will need to find this company now so that we can implement it immediately if we were to locate one that was dangerous or potentially dangerous. David? Well, I'd like to still pursue something. Um, there's definitely, I mean, I've lived here 15 years. I, I feel there's something going on out there. There's so much growth. I think we're pushing the coyotes into the city. Uh, like I said, I've, I've always noticed a coyote every once in a while on the golf course, but it's, it was very rare to see one on the golf course. I might see one every, maybe once a year, maybe once every other year. But Saturday night, I, I hit one right in front of Rundy Park, uh, 20 miles an hour. So I just spun him around and stopped, and he just kept on going. But, but I, I can tell you that <laughs> I used to hear cats fighting outside my window all the time. I don't hear cats fighting outside my window anymore. And, uh, you wish I, you did. Well, I mean, where do they go? I mean, I, you know, Yeah, well, that's where they went. I'm that's, pretty sure. And all my neighbors aren't seeing their cats. They're not. They don't have cats out there anymore. So, yeah. It's, I mean, it's going to change our way of life. You just. I mean, if I had a puppy, I wouldn't turn, let my puppy go outside by itself anymore. You know, mm -mm. I just. It could be owls. It could be all kinds of stuff. It's. But I just. You know, I just. That, there's that feeling. That you just don't let things go out like it used to be anymore. So, yeah. but I think we have to do something. We have to at least try something. Like Ryan said, we have to. I think we ought to pursue something and see what's out there. And if our traps come up empty, then maybe we don't have the problem we think we have. And if we do start catching something and maybe we just try it for a while until nature has t try time to adapt a little bit but we can't I, I think we can't just do nothing for a while and then give kind of nature a time to balance out but we do I mean we can't get up get rid of them all because there's got to be a balance out there too yeah uh, but I think we should try something for, for three months and just see what happens and, I, and then we'll and then we'll go from there all right um, this is what I'm hearing um, is that we should approve the, the uh, coyote management plan, um, but the plan doesn't stop there. Um, we continue to try and find someone who can trap these coyotes for us and find out what that cost is going to be. Um, if we can find someone with liability insurance. Um, mm -hmm. The two gentlemen that you spoke to, if they had liability insurance, I'm pretty sure this council would have voted to hire one of them tonight. Um, so I think, I think what I'm hearing here tonight at this table, and I'm also hearing in the community, I agree, we've got to do something. Um, what that is, we don't know yet. Um, but I think the, the option of adopting this management plan um, is something that we should, we should try um, and then continue to pursue someone else to, to try and trap them for us. And, you know, if, if, if Mount Pleasant was successful with the, this plan, did they trap as well, or they just no, they left killed. Alone? They, they killed. They killed. Yeah. Who did they have come in and kill? Area um, wildlife people. I mean, we we've got tons of those around here okay. that will come in and kill. There you go. Uh, as far as the trap and relocate, and that was going to be my my question is, is the direction to to I mean, as I'm looking um, in in talking to these companies, is it still to trap and relocate, or is it to trap and eliminate? Well, I, I think it kind of, I'll have to answer that with a question. When these are relocated, these aren't just 
going to be happy lives. Oh, no, they're, they're not becoming pets, no right. matter. So they're getting killed no matter what. It, it, eventually, yes, ma'am. So I don't really see that should be, I think the safest way of getting rid of them should be the way we need to look at it. But um, their end result is still death. Same fate. After talking with the companies when this first came up, uh, one company we did come across uh, uses collar traps versus leg traps. Mm -hmm. You're less likely to catch other things. Uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't kill them, but um, or maim them, but it will hold them in place. You're less you're not going to catch a a child or some kid running you know playing in the woods or something like that along the golf course in it. Um, you're less likely to catch a a uh, domesticated animal in it. Uh, or a deer or something like that. And it, it, it is pretty much specific to canine, and it's for canines that are being baited. Um, usually your, your, uh, you know, your little chihuahua or something, I mean, they're, they're not getting into that. Um, you know, they're, not, they're not out hunting for food. Um, so it, it's, you know, the success rate on the you know, with it predominantly being coyotes is a lot higher than with a leg trap. But there's, there's lots of companies here in the, in the Charlotte metro area that, that – that will eliminate, um, but they will not give me any type of, yeah. You know, what's what are the odds of you catching anything? You know, like, well, we don't know. Well, we were going <laughs> to catch and relocate because it was cheaper for us. Correct. So, I mean, it wasn't that we were, like you said, we, they weren't going to a zoo. Right. So now, does this window continue to close if we go to trap and kill, or or you, you can trap and kill anytime. one? Okay, so we don't have to worry about the December one to March third, March first. On the trap and on the trap and kill, no, sir. On the trap and relocate, yes, sir. But from what I was reading on DNR, if it was known to be a threat, you can get a special permit yes. to remove mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. we can execute, uh, for lack of better or, word yeah. there. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> they could be removed. Yes. Okay. All right, so I think you, you need us to adopt this plan. And if, I think if, if, if that's if, what you want to do, yes. If you, and you have direction. Excuse me. You have direction from us to move forward with finding someone else to trap and kill. Okay. Mm. Oh. Is that agreed? Yeah. It or, is. Is that what I'm hearing? I think so, but I think that the public really needs to understand that just because this were to be implemented, this could become a false sense of security because Correct. you really are not going to be guaranteed that we're going to catch these, and they are smart from everything that, that I have correct. read and that we've heard. They will learn when their population adapt. numbers are down, and, and therefore they will reproduce larger litters. Yeah. Well, and obviously, if, if uh, with, with council's permission, as, as we engage a company to do this, obviously the first two places they're going to start are those two circled areas. Mm -hmm. right. um, once we catch one or two in those areas, now we've got to figure out where they are again um, because they're going to have to move the traps because the coyotes aren't going to keep coming back to that area. They're going to they're find somewhere else to be. Um, so... And because there's a cost associated with this, we're not, I mean, this, I'm speaking for me, I'm not talking about doing this for a long time. We're just talking about seeing how this works for a little while and then coming back and reporting. This isn't a permanent thing on and on Understood. and on. Well, but Charlie still has to come back to us and tell us who he's found and what right, he right. hears and what so he's learned and what's the cost right. and how right. does this happen right. and when do they do it. And sure. And then we you need know, to educate the Because I need to get out of the neighborhood. Happening. Where right. it is and, and are we going happening. to those areas only. Um, that's all going to be a process that we're going to have to worry about right. or work through. So that means it's not coming back to us probably until the 17th of January. Is that correct? The and earliest. the council has a special meeting. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. But I can I can have you um, yeah. I can have you the information, the company, the cost, um, their processes, everything. Um, After we'll the new we'll year. begin interviewing um, almost immediately, okay. Um, okay. talking with different companies in the area, and we'll get it pared down to apples to apples so that basically it just boils down to the cost point. Um, and we'll bring that to council for um, approval or disapproval at your January meeting. Potentially okay. we might need to talk to these people here. I mean, if there's in a public hearing or in a least before sure. council may not have to be a public hearing. Okay. The other thing is, is if you do this, you have to go out and get bids and all that jazz for this type of work or a, uh, we, we, won't, cost, we won't solicit but. for public bids, but we will get multiple quotes okay. uh, at, at the cost level that uh, I'm kind of getting the sense where council is on this. Uh, it's not something that will reach, reach the threshold for public bids, uh, but we will, um, we will obtain multiple quotes okay. uh, to be able to uh, compare. 
Uh, with that, council, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to approve the Tiga K Coyote Management Plan. A motion by Dottie Hersey. Do I have a second? Second. Second by David O'Neill. Um, any further discussion? Um, would it please council to open it up to public comments? Sure. Step to the mic, state your name and address. Uh, Gene Nesro, 3081 Point Clear Drive. Um, I got two questions. What's the liability insurance cost? Does anybody know? Well, I bet it's pretty high, but no. It's, it's not liability insurance that we have to carry. It's a liability insurance the trapper has to carry. The trapper does. Right. Correct. It, it depends yeah, on their that, insurance and company. And that whatever his insurance is would come from his insurance company, what that cost is. It, but if it's nominal, maybe. He, he's going to bake it into us. He can bake it into his price if he was. But from what, up, from what we just heard from Charlie, he spoke to those two gentlemen. Who didn't want to do it. But if you talk to him, I, I could talk to him. But anyway, another solution it just put the traps out at night. They're nocturnal, pretty much. Just put the traps out at night, and then during the day, you don't have to worry about catching. <laughs> Come on, don't tell the coyotes what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> they can watch the TV, and they'll know what we're doing. <laughs> well, that's the only thing I had. Tell him. Thanks, Gene. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Anybody else? Closed council comments or public comments? Call the question. All in favor, say we're saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Um, item number 4B on the agenda is the TGK Forever Foundation, City Manager Charlie Funderburg. Forever? Or, I don't know. Forever. 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 Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, this, um, we discussed this at your November 30th workshop uh, where I presented the idea of forming the TK Forever Foundation. The primary purpose of this foundation would be to close the funding gap for Catawba Park provided, um, by providing residents and uh, businesses they would like to financially contribute a tax favorable means in which to be able to do so. Um, during, it, it appeared that during that uh, workshop discussion, council was uh, seemed to be on board with this. Uh, I was asked to bring it back uh, tonight uh, for council to be able to uh, vote publicly on it as we did not have uh, any public attendance at our, um, at our workshop. But this this foundation, I think, could be a fantastic thing. Uh, Bob McCleave and I, uh, our attorney, have, have spoken a good bit about it um, yeah, as far as what it's going to take uh, to, to get this thing up and going. Um, I, I, for one, am extremely excited about it. I think this can be a, a huge positive long beyond Catawba Park with allowing folks to, um, yeah, even even in their wills, to, to leave gifts for that, that park here in town that meant the most to them. And yeah, maybe as they were raising their children, yeah, and, and uh, being around those parks. So, um, again, I put this uh, for council um, and would ask for a favorable um, favorable vote at this time in order for us to begin the process of moving forward uh, with creating this uh, 501c3 foundation. Uh, Charlie, before we get into that, the, the, you sent to say right up uh, all of council and has a purpose there. Yes, sir. Can you do us a favor and just read to the public what that can Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. The Tiki K Forever Foundation recognizes that parks and open spaces are a major part of what makes Tiki K a special place to live, work, and play. It is the mission of the foundation to enhance the quality of life for citizens of all ages by promoting, providing for, and maintaining parks and open spaces which strengthen and unite the community. In that effort, the foundation's purpose is to serve as the fundraising arm of the city of Tiki K for the endowment of capital projects and educational, recreational, and cultural community initiatives and events by requesting, receiving, holding, investing, administering, granting, and dispersing gifts of funds and property and making expenditures to or for the benefit of the parks and open spaces owned by the city. Thank you. Council, do you have any, well, entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the Tiga K Forever Foundation and authorize the city manager to move forward with submitting all necessary documents and forms to the South Carolina Secretary of State and the IRS. Motion by David O'Neill. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ryan Richard. Um, any council discussion? Uh, I just want to say I appreciate that you included that the officers must rotate every two years. I included that in after my concern about having people on there too long. So that's great. Any other council discussion? There being none, call the question. All in favor, sing or saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Approved. Item number 5A on the agenda on a new business is a resolution to rescind um, resolution 2016-06. City Manager Charlie Funderburg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. This may be a first for us, uh, rescinding a, a resolution. We had a good bit of conversation about it on staff. Um, as council will recall, um, you did pass resolution 2016-06, and that provided that uh, South State Bank would be providing financing for golf capital projects. Um, as we move beyond the resolution point, and we're trying to um, get to the closing point, um, South State Bank just could not provide the closing, uh, the appropriate closing documents. They were trying; they continued to try to do it under a promissory note, which is not an allowable means of borrowing uh, for the city. So, um, with that, um, we had to basically rescind, um, you know, awarding them the bid um, because time had passed. We could not go to the next lowest bidder; they would not hold that interest rate for that amount of time. So, we did have to put it out for uh, for bid again, which is the follow-up resolution, but before that can be enacted, uh, we need for council to rescind this one, and we apologize for that. So, Mr. Mayor, we'll turn this back over to you. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to approve re resolution rescinding resolution 2016-06, authorizing the lease purchase of equipment for golf course maintenance in the form of an equipment lease purchase agreement not to exceed $237,000. Motion by Dottie Hurst, you don't have a second? Second. Second by Jen Stalford. Any council discussion? There being none, call the question. All in favor, saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Sorry, Tim. Um, item number 5B on the agenda is a resolution to uh, lease purchase the golf course capital items. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, this is a resolution uh, for those capital projects with the exception of the irrigation pump and the cart path uh, resurfacing. Uh, that, those two items were the, were the hang up uh, with South State Bank. Um, and it, they basically they can't provide lease purchasing for something that they can't come collect if we don't make the payments on. Oh. Um, so, you know, they can't come up, Novel. tear up the cart paths or, and they don't want to come get an irrigation pump that Really, we're not replacing with a new, we're repairing um, the old. Um, wow. So with that, um, we've put it back out for bid. BBNT was the successful, um, the, uh, did present the um, low or best terms. Uh, those terms are 2.41% at seven years. Uh, we have uh, been talking with our golf management company on this. Um, the other items they can find out of their operational cash. Um, so. Um, they are on board with this. The uh, payment structure, uh, as far as the amortization schedule with this, uh, with this loan, does fit within their um, their budget that they presented to council uh, for sixteen seventeen. Perfect. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, council, entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, members of council, motion to approve resolution authorizing the lease purchase of equipment for golf course capital items as stated above, and not to exceed $212,000. I have a motion by Jen Stalford. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Dottie Hersey. Any council discussion? Being none, call the question. All in favor, signal saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Item number 5C on the agenda is the approval of the H tax funds for Heron Harbor Park and resurfacing of the tennis courts. City Manager Charlie Funderburg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council, um, as we went through this, pro uh, through the uh, aforementioned process with the banks um, they can do the uh, they can do the playground equipment but they can't do the tennis courts uh, because that's basically the equivalent of resurfacing and cart pass um, so as, as we began looking and uh, looking at this we did have um, money set aside for financing out of the general fund but both of these two particular items actually can be funded uh, through uh, local H tax dollars that we've collected so what, what we've got before you tonight um, yeah, is this was not a budgeted item in HTAX. I can't authorize the spending of those dollars until y'all, until you as council uh, would authorize me to do so. Um, we currently, our uh, fund balance right now in our um, HTAX is $97,640 as of November 30th. And obviously we, we're collecting HTAX every single month. So um, we, what we would propose is being able to do both of these projects um, out of the H tax funds uh, and be able to uh, go ahead and move forward with them as planned. Your um, tennis court resurfacing um, 
and your um, and the um, uh, playground replacement uh, replacement playground equipment. And I'm sorry, I did not include that figure. Uh, let's see. Your total amount is going to be thirty-two thousand dollars. Okay, but this and this is not part of what we just removed the approval. That's correct. The this is this completely is separate thing. Different. You just completely related separate. that it's a similar situation. It's, it is similar. Yes, ma'am. Because I lost so you there for one second. Basically, what you would do is you would not be spending the seventy-nine hundred dollars in general fund that was budgeted for this year. Instead, you would be shifting that entire expense, and instead of financing anything, we would just be paying cash. And getting and still getting both projects done, and so wouldn't, we would be eliminating the financing altogether, and and shifting it over into H tax. And this both of these projects do qualify under H tax. But remind me, where was was the Her the Heron Harbor Park and the resurfacing of the tennis courts? Was that yes, it? That was it. Was that in our budget already? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, the the financing payment was in the general fund side. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Council entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve H tax funds for Heron Harbor Park and, resurf and resurfacing of tennis courts as stated above. I have a motion by David O'Neill. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Dottie Hersey. Any more council discussion? There being none, call the question. All in favor, say we're saying aye. 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 Unanimous. <clears throat> I do have a question though regarding how soon you think they'll be done. Oh, now wait a minute. You're done. You can't, we can't bring this back anymore. <laughs> I know, but. <laughs> Just curious how, when do you sure. think the projects would be occurring? Uh, Heron Harbor uh, is early. Uh, we would want to get that done before spring um, just because, um, and Joey Bleth, and I apologize, he, he had, to, had to leave earlier, but uh, he's been working with uh, residents down in Heron Harbor, getting them involved similar to the way I did with the Winsong residents when we built that park. Um, but as our maintenance staff would be included in that, our park maintenance staff would be included in that construction project, we'd want to get it done um, probably before the end of February. Okay. Um, now, the tennis courts, uh, he's working on getting those scheduled, but we're, we are shooting for an, an early spring, um, and we've notified the folks that utilize those courts for league play and things like that that there may be an interruption, but we're, we're not going to keep, you know, last year we tried to work around them, and, it went into June, and then it got pushed to July, and then I, I don't think we actually had them resurfaced until um, August or September um, because we kept trying to work around things, and it, it, it got a little dicey. So we're, we're going to be pushing. As soon as we can get scheduled, we want to pull the trigger on those. So. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Item number 5D on the agenda is the 2017 schedule of regular city council meetings. Um, it says here Charlie Funderburk is the guy explaining what's going to happen here, but I think it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Pretty self-explanatory, absolutely. Right. Um, we are required by law to publish, uh, and council is required to, to approve your regular meeting dates for the year. Uh, we do send, those, uh, send that to the media. Um, we put together the schedule based on what this past year was for your regular meetings, which is the third Monday of every month, um, beginning at 6 p.m., as we've done this year, with the exception of January and February due to the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday and President's Day holiday, and it would be on the Tuesday following uh, the third Monday uh, on both of those two months. Thank you, Charlie. Council entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to approve the city council uh, regular meeting schedule for 2017 as presented by the city manager. Motion by Dottie Hersey. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Jennifer Stalford. Any council, any discussion? There being none, call the question. All in favor, signal saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Item number six on the agenda is the city manager's report. Charlie Funderburg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, just a, a few quick things to, uh, to run through. Uh, Santa did make his final trip to TGK this past Saturday yes, to did. check his list one final time. Um, I'd like to thank all the volunteers and the staff who are a part of not just that event, but all the events that we had this year um, from, from making those special. Um, yeah, a lot of people think 4th of July when they think TGK, but Christmas really is special around this, uh, around this city, and I really do appreciate the, the volunteers and the staff that worked really hard to, uh, to put those events together. Um, City Hall will be closed on Friday, December 23rd, and Monday, December 26th uh, for the Christmas holidays. Uh, we will also be closed on Monday, January 2nd for New Year's. Um, 
trash and recycle collection is changing for residents who do not live on the peninsula. So we're talking Stonecrest, Cameron Creek, Serenity Point, River Lakes, and Lake Ridge. Um, Katie did a uh, piece on that uh, in this past week's Rewind. We've been pushing it on social media and on the city's website, and we'll continue to do so. But basically, in a nutshell, uh, come starting January 6th with uh, what would be the peninsula's normal recycle day, Everybody's on the same re recycle day, and everybody's going to Monday trash collection. Uh, so Signature Waste will be in the city uh, doing all trash every Monday and uh, on the every other Friday uh, schedule that the Peninsula currently has. So if you live in Lakeshore, you live in traditional TGK, nothing's changing for you except for the changes on the holidays. And if this has confused you thoroughly, go to our <laughs> website. We have a garbage and recycle calendar. You can sign up through the Notify Me. It will send you text and email alerts the day before your, your garbage and recycle is supposed to be out. Um, and we update it uh, based on you know, holiday changes and things like that. So if you subscribe to it, you'll get the changes uh, and to keep it simple. So I uh, do want to let everybody know about that. Our uh, fire hydrant project that council approved is uh, well underway. Um, I think they've completed six of the eight taps. Um, necessary so we should we should be completing that project here in the next month or two um, so there uh, if it will stop raining but I don't want to wish the rain away because I remember what the summer was like so um, some good uh, some other good stuff I would like to congratulate Hunter Atkins from our development services department and Philip Jolly our utilities director on being named the 2016 employee of the year and department head of the year respectively uh, their professionalism, hard work, and dedication to the city and our residents has been exemplary, and we cannot thank these gentlemen enough for their efforts. Um, Employee of the Year uh, was, uh, they were nominated by uh, their respective department heads, um, as, and the um, Department Head of the Year were uh, nominated and discussed by myself and Katie Paulson, my assistant city manager. So congratulations to those two folks uh, for their valiant effort uh, over, the past, uh, over the past year. Do they get a parking space now? No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> they, they get their picture hung up in City Hall <laughs> in the lobby and a nice pat on the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I am pleased to report that the new landscape projects we had scheduled for this year are almost completed. Um, crews have re-landscaped the old wellhouse sites. Um, and if you have driven past the number nine tee box during the daylight, you've seen the Junipers are gone. Uh, new plants uh, should start going in this week, uh, weather permitting, uh, along with the, um, the golf course is actually doing the irrigation part of that, stubbing off of the tee box irrigation so that we can water them. But with the weather the way it is, I don't know that we really need any help in that area <laughs> anytime soon. But i um, really excited about those projects. Thank you to uh, Tim Gillette for uh, coordinating with contractors and staff and, and working on, on those things. Um, we, uh, this past Friday, I held um, our annual department head retreat. Um, I get together with department heads. We do that at my house. Uh, we just do it off site, plan uh, time to engage and plan for the coming year um, and what our focus really needs to be on. Um, we're doing a little bit differently this year. They're going to they're gonna be taking the information from that meeting and getting together with their individual departments uh, or department leaders. Um, and then what I would like to do is probably sometime in late March, early April, is schedule a workshop with council um, and use this kind of as a roll into uh, getting ready for uh, the 1718 budget preparation. So um, once we get to that point, uh, Sylvia will float some dates, um, some dates out to you uh, and see what we can get on the calendar and we'll, we'll work towards that end. Uh, but it was a very, very successful department head retreat. Uh, I think we've got a lot of good actual items coming out of this one. So looking right. forward to that. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas uh, to council and your families. Um, I know they give up a lot of time uh, with you so that you can do the business of the city. And I appreciate them doing that. And uh, happy holidays to everybody. And Merry Christmas to those that are playing along at home tonight. Thank you, Charlie. Any questions for uh, Charlie? Jen? Come on, Actually, Jen, I have, have a heart. It's holidays. <laughs> I've had a lot of residents asking about the buoys. Um, oh, they'll yeah. be reevaluated as we had directed, yes. and you said you're going to be working into it. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I have 
chatted about it, but mm -hmm. if you could just update everybody. We have, um, we have reached back out to uh, SEDNR as was, um, as was uh, asked for, directed by council. Um, actually, we've got a letter back from them today. Um, Spires, um, Investigator Spires, who did it last go round, uh, is working on trying to get that scheduled and will let us know when it will be. Um, this go round, we, instead of just all codes all the way around TGK, we actually sent them a map and highlighted like the smaller codes so that they're not going in thinking we want all of Nivens Creek and all of Torrance Creek, you know, the, the big large codes, you know, when, you know, the, the complaints that I have seen or have heard or have been relayed to me from you, uh, from, from council members are really the smaller coves yeah. tucked away, you know, kind of thing with, yeah. uh, jet skiers and, um, yeah, uh, fishermen during bass tournaments, things like that. So we did send them a map this time. Um, and, um, we did get a letter back. Uh, Chief Parker did today actually, uh, from investigator Spires who did our last one. So hopefully we'll, um, typically they do those, uh, in the summer months. So I'm thinking May, June timeframe, but obviously if they do come in earlier, uh, and provide us with information. We'll, we'll be bringing it back to you as soon as we have it. All right, thank you. Ryan? Nothing. No, no questions, no. All right. Um, item number seven on the agenda are public comments. Are there any public comments? There being none, close public comments. Now we go on to, oh, sorry. Hey, Steve, how are you? What's that? How are you? Good. Good, Good as I can. First of all, I thought you started at 7 o'clock. I'm sorry. That's okay. You obviously have an uh, executive session afterwards? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, for those of you who don't know me, and to tell you the truth, I don't know anybody here except George. It's hard to believe. <laughs> and Charlie. My name is Steve Forrest. I'm president of the uh, Callaway Ranch Home Property Owners Association. Uh, to give you a little background, I've lived in this community for going on 42 years. I served four terms as a city councilman. Prior to the city being formed, I was also one of the directors of the POA and helped write the, uh, the legal documents and everything to create the city, as well as a lot of the laws. Uh, I understand that you have discussed a little bit about the uh, Coyote situation. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, I'm the one who called, the, wrote the paper, and uh, hopefully it will be, hopefully your actions tonight or in the future will take some action against these animals. Uh, we've lost two pets by uh, coyote attacks. Being the president of our association, I get, I've gotten multiple calls from residents about the coyote situation. I was told about one today that happened last night, either Saturday night or Sunday night, where one of the newer residents in the townhomes was woke up by the, uh, by the sounds, the horrible sounds yep. of an animal being ta attacked and killed behind her house. Uh, we don't know what it was, whether it was a pet or a deer or what it was, but it was so loud that it woke the woman out of her sleep. That same area of the townhouses has also seen multiple sightings during the daytime mm -hmm. of coyotes. We also have had situations in that same area, and this is going back to quote your article, the quote, areas of concern were lot holes five and six, and 17 and 18. Well, this is in, this is in five and six, all right? Uh, we experienced a situation last summer where uh, apparently uh, two coyotes formed a den down there and the residents could constantly hear the sounds of pups, mm -hmm. five or six coyote pups down there. So you take the pups in their natural habitat and the adults, all of a sudden you've got seven or eight coyotes roaming out of a central location below the sixth, feral, sixth hole on the, uh, on the pines. This is a problem that we haven't had in the past. As I said, I've been here almost 42 years. We've never had this problem. We've never had a situation where we had to be concerned about our, our, our dogs, our, our, 
or cats or anything else being attacked. But all of a sudden we have one. And the only answer we get from the wildlife and from the mayor on discussions on this thing is basically to live with it because they're going to keep on coming. Now, we have basically our old TKK is a peninsula. 16 miles of shoreline. I know all the all the articles from the from the sales brochure in those days. This is if we can't control a peninsula with two openings, something's wrong. Now Steve, we understand. Steve, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap it up. We're going to we're going to continue to uh, have coyotes come in and out of this community. But we have a pro we have a bad problem where we are. It's obvious, you know. We have a trapper <clears throat> that's going to come in and live trap around where that den is and get rid of the and get rid of that group around that that trap area or make the effort to do it. According to the mayor, it's open season now, December 1st through March 1st. We can trap. I've got people that are saying, well, you know, if this keeps up, I'm going to get my son to come up here and shoot him. Yeah. You know, and let's face it, when a gun goes off in that area, you don't know which side of the lake it goes off on, to be honest, because of the echo. Steve. Now, I don't want to see that. Steve, excuse yeah. me. We have a three-minute rule for public comments. Okay. You're extending your three-minute rule. A lot of the stuff that you're talking about right now is stuff that we've already discussed. Okay. Um, that will be on the city website tomorrow. Um, and you can watch that, and you can see the action what the council has What action did you vote on, George? Uh, we voted on action to take care of the coyote plan that the city manager went to Mount Pleasant and got the coyote plan, and also the city manager is going to come back to us. Well, well I have to get back to my, to my people. What Steve, I, I would plan? suggest Steve, I would suggest you go on the city website tomorrow, and you'll hear, you'll see it all on public comments, or excuse me, during the council comments. And, and Charlie, the is the copy of that management plan available already in that packet? Uh, no, we didn't put it online until we got feedback from council. Okay. Uh, now that we have that, it will be posted uh, online tomorrow. Fantastic. Right. Well, George, the only thing is it's fine to have a plan. But, you know, it's just like everything else. You know, you promise something, and if, you, if all you say is a plan, and we, we go it's another It's not always Steve, said, Steve. Steve, 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 please. We, we have public comments. We ask the public for three minutes Steve, of public I comments. All the people down. I understand. Okay. I understand. But Steve, you're asking questions that we've already gone through. You've, we've already discussed a lot of the things that you're asking questions on. So I would like ask you request respectfully that you go on the city website tomorrow, see the, the council meeting that we had, and I'd be more than willing to sit with you after that. Okay, any member of council would be willing to sit with you well, after you've well, gone through that. Steve, if you wait just a few minutes after our regular meeting's over before we go to executive session, I'll give you a thumbnail summary of what you missed, and then you can still watch it online. But we approved a management okay. plan. We sent back. We, just give us, give, let us finish this, and if you don't mind staying for two or three minutes, yeah. I'll give you a quick synopsis. Well, I, time now. I know, but we, we do want you to watch what's online. I'll give you a quick thumbnail so you know what you're talking about when you leave here, okay. and, and then you'll, you can get the full story online. If, we've if, got about 100 residents that are very concerned. Well, there's, well, a, there's about, there's about like 9,000 that, that, are, that are concerned, concerned. for Thank, sure. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Item number eight on the agenda are council comments. Ryan? I don't have much. Um, I'd like to say thanks to the city staff. I've gotten... 15 or 20 text messages thanking me for how great the Christmas lights look coming into TKK. I didn't do anything, um, but, but the entrance looks especially great this year, um, as well as all the way down TKK Drive. So thanks to the staff for doing a great job there, and just happy holidays and Merry Christmas to everyone. Jen? Um, I just want to say that the Beautification Committee does not meet in the month of December for their meeting, but we do have a work day tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We'll be cutting roses, and yes, it'll be cold, but we'll be more than happy to see some new volunteers. Hmm. Dottie? 
Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to everybody. I, I can't believe that we're at the end of the year. I know. I Man, it feels like Ryan and David, it's like this should be like your third meeting. And believe, I mean, you've been here all year already. I, I, I just can't get over it. But hope everyone has a safe and happy holiday, and I hope the coyotes go on vacation. Um, and uh, we'll get back at it next year. I think it was a successful year for the city, for council, and uh, still one of the best places to live that I know of, uh, coyotes and all. So uh, happy holidays, safe travels. See you next year. Thank you, Dottie. David? And I want to echo what Ryan said. Everybody says the same to me about driving in and seeing those beautiful lights and the trees. And I would like to just say Merry Christmas to everybody and a happy, safe New Year. Uh, one of the things that I like to do in this December meeting, our last meeting of the year, I like to go over some of the 2016 accomplishments. Um, and I've broken them down into several different ways. And first is uh, council and administration. We added two new council members, David and Ryan. Uh, council adopted the 10-year capital improvements program, which identifies future capital expenditures and all finan fiscal financial planning guide for the city. Uh, continue to improve our communications by reformatting the, uh, the weekly newsletter, the TC Rewind. Uh, TGK Connect, which is the Neighborhood Empowerment Program, increased the presence on social media with almost 2,000 more followers on Facebook and 700 more on Twitter. We started using Periscope to highlight the city events. We had the extra mile, which is for the, the youth to volunteer in the city. We had 24 participants. We held the second and third sessions of the Citizens Academy with 46 more residents that went through the program. Under new business and developments, we welcomed the Shore Club. New businesses, Dairy Queen, not, nothing but cake, Dottie's favorite place. Mm. Dentist office, uh, GNC, the Omega Learning Center, the Learning Experience Daycare Facility, Comporium Retail Center, which is the first on this side of the river. Uh, the um, New Greek restaurant that's going in next to uh, the TEK Deli. Um, Lake Ridge and Serenity Point and River Lakes are nearing completion. Preliminary plat approval for construction has begun on the Revere, the single largest investment to the city to date at $17 million. Windhaven was approved that gave us another 20 acres of recreational space with money going towards the development, seven acres of commercial space. Game on PDD was approved at the completion with at its completion will have more retail, mixed housing uses, a hotel, a movie theater, four acre recreational and fitness space under one roof. Um, in total, that investment is about sixty million dollars. Uh, brought in the cadence, which is a um, which will give us a permanent wood chipping site for the residential debris. Um, it also gives us additional age targeted housing that will allow folks to live and age in place. Infrastructure projects, nearly completion of Hubert Graham Way anticipated opening in late winter, early spring. Repaved TGK Drive and added curb and gutter to the outbound side. Also repaired storm drains. Uh, water meter out, um, change outs and removal, um, meter completion. 95% of the sewer system rehab, which is $6.5 million investment into the city, uh, excuse me, into the system. Uh, new lift station and a force main. We added two booster pump stations to maintain consistent water pressure throughout the city. $500,000 in FEMA grants for the generators. Hydrant project, which is almost complete. Eight new hydrants being installed in areas of traditional TGK where hydrants distance was greater than the current code. Over 17 stormwater repair projects completed. Stormwater equipment purchased to help preventive maintenance. Remove the well houses within uh, the right-of-ways on the streets. Enhanced landscaping throughout the city. The former well houses, the foundation, um, the fountain area at Shoreline Parkway. Uh, the village uh, monument landscape. Trailhead Park, number nine tee box, Windjammer and TGK Drive. Extension of the trail onto Windjammer from crosswalk to the golf course. Began installation of the walking trail in Lake Ridge. Uh, added irrigation to the original back nine of the golf course. Under parks and recreation, we installed sidewalks at Windjammer to make the Terrence Creek um, side more accessible. Resurfaced four of the six tennis courts and included pickleball court. 
saw an increase in parks and rec numbers, including the uh, summer camps. Uh, beach and swim center facelift, resurfaced the pool, additional deck space and landscaping. Successfully community events, Eddie's East Concert for Kidneys, four food truck rallies, um, the July 4th Festival, the Fall Festival, the Christmas Tree Lighting, and the Mayor's Cup. Under public safety, so, excuse me, under public safety. Broke ground on the fire station number two. Um, upgraded the ISO rating to a two, top 5% in the nation of fire, uh, the nation's rated fire departments. Purchased a new pumper truck. We have five nationally certified and three state certified EMT firefighters, and the three that are state certified will be um, receiving their national certifications next month. We had our inaugural uh, camp cadet, which um, allowed young people to interact with the public safety officials, um, and a special Olympics polar bear plunge. Uh, the patrol zone implemented the in-car tablets to increase efficiencies and visibility of our officers. We had the accreditation of the police department. We received $31,000 in grants for body cameras. We hired a full-time clerk of court for the municipal court in, in City Hall. In 2017, we're looking forward to the groundbreaking at Catawba Park, the starting of the TGK Forever Foundation, the completion of Fire Station 2, conducting a facility asset, uh, assessment and needs study for our police department, body camera implementation for PD, groundbreaking on Game On, resurfacing the four remaining tennis courts, and removing the large EQ holding tank on the second quarter of 2017. Now I understand why we're all tired. Um, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year, um, and we look forward to seeing you in January. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'd like to make a motion to move into executive session to discuss contractual matters related to the proposed sale of city-owned properties and to receive legal advice in regard to FOIA. I have a motion by Dottie Hersey. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Jennifer Stalford. Any discussion? There being none, call the question. All in favor, signal saying aye. 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 We're in executive session.